Okay, so um, uh, yes, welcome again to our online talk with uh, Phyllis Omido in the name of the Waldstadt Asphalt Alliance and the Climate Camp at the Dannenröder Wald. We're really happy that you're here today uh, with us. And um, so, uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, there have been some technical difficulties um, with people at the climate camp, but hopefully they can join in uh, our discussion soon and then also participate uh, with questions and other things. Um, Genau, ähm, bevor wir anfangen, würde ich gerne noch kurz ein paar organisatorische Hinweise geben, auf Deutsch erst und dann noch auf Englisch. Ähm, genau, der ganze Talk wird auf Englisch stattfinden ähm, und wird auch aufgenommen. Das heißt, ihr könnt die Aufnahme im Nachhinein auch noch auf unserer Webseite waldstadtausfall.net ähm, nachschauen. Ähm, zum Ablauf, ähm, gleich äh, werde ich ähm, Phyllis Omido noch ähm, kurz vorstellen, daraufhin wird sie dann einen Impulsvortrag halten und im Anschluss daran gibt es die Möglichkeit, äh, Fragen zu stellen. Ihr könnt äh, die ganze Zeit im Public Chat, ähm, das seht ihr oben links auf der Leiste, Fragen stellen, die wir dann sammeln werden und am Ende gebündelt äh, oder genau weitergeben werden. Und ähm, genau. So this talk will be recorded and you can find it afterwards on our website, waldstadtasphalt.net. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk in the public chat that you can find on the top left of your screen. Um, okay, so these are the organizational um, hints. So now we can uh, yes, start with the talk. So maybe just briefly some words about uh, Waldstadt Asphalt. So Waldstadt Asphalt is the name of the former occupation in the Dannenröder Forest, um, where activists lived for more than one year to protect the Dannenröder Forest against the Highway 49. And is also the name of the alliance that was um, founded to support the struggle of the activists there. So here, uh, like in Dannenrod, um, people have been fighting for four years against this highway, which has a lot of um, bad effects on the drinking water, like it's the climate crisis. It's so clear that this highway is actually also from a um, traffic point of view not necessary, like it will actually create more traffic, it will make the environment, the, the environment less nice for the people here, so people have been organizing a lot against it. Unfortunately, the trees could not be saved, so last December the forest was cut, um, but actually we don't see this as, like, we, re we really see this as the starting point uh, of a bigger anti-car movement in Germany and beyond as well. So in this context, we are especially excited that you, Phyllis, are here today with us to also maybe talk more about because I think, especially with the car industry, which is such an international um, and has like so many international production chains and um, also so many impacts that maybe we in Germany are not even aware about, I think it's so important to, to look at the big picture and not just sort of swim in our own struggles, but actually talk about especially the implications that the car industry and our German cars have on other countries and they're actually quite big. And that's why I'm really excited that you're here today and can tell us more about it. And with these words, I would um, now hand over to you, maybe just some more words so you don't need to like introduce yourself. Um, like Phyllis Omido has been fighting against the car industry and especially the lead recycling of old car batteries in Kenya, I think like for the last decade. And uh, she was working in a lead factory when her actually like her son um, first became explicitly ill. And when she found out that her son was ill, then she started a big campaign and um, had a lot of great successes and and actually also had to, I think, some life-threatening um, things as well that happened to you, like the government not being happy about what you did. So I think you can much better tell us about what you actually were working on. And with these words, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you so much, Dave, for the introduction. and. Um... It's a great pleasure to be here. I know uh, coming from uh, very different backgrounds, we are from a developing country and you are from a developed country. It's easier uh, most of the time for people to be oblivious of what happens uh, in, this, in this part of the world. But it's, uh, I'm very proud of everyone that has managed to join and has interest in understanding how the car uh, industry can affect us on this side of the world because most of the time we feel it, I feel the impact of uh, manufacturing that is happening uh, miles away from us, but we don't share in the benefits that, that come with it. 
So I'll share a bit of my story and my background and uh, the situation as it is now. Uh, and then I will allow uh, the participants to ask questions. Um, so as I've been introduced, my name is Phyllis Omido. I'm going to share a slide just to bring you home uh, to where we are. Um, Jay, is the, is the slide visible? Uh, yes, it's the third, I can see the third slide. All right, excellent. Um, so uh, who is Phyllis Omido? Uh, Phyllis Omido is a mother and uh, I have Nate shows me as an environmental activist um, and I, I work around the environment and uh, environmental justice, but I am known globally um, because of my fight against pollution uh, from used, uh, recycling of used lead battery acid uh, recycling in, in, in Kenya. Um, before you, you can see uh, a community and children playing under a chimney. Um, you can see that there is a wall that separates uh, a community. Uh, this is a community of 3,000 Kenyans. Uh, and this lead battery recycling plant was brought into the community in 2008. And uh, with the promise of creating jobs for the, for the people, but with very little information as to what the impacts would be to the environment and uh, especially to the children because you can see the children playing under the chimneys they do not understand that uh, what is coming from behind them is uh, actually toxic uh, chemicals that, that is going to affect them for the rest of their lives um, so i began uh, my fight uh, because i was employed in a lead smelter and uh, when we went into the smelter they not tell us uh, exactly what the impact would be of working here. All we knew that we had uh, gotten jobs in a new industry, and both government and the the industry failed in terms of giving us um, access to information that could enable us to decide whether we wanted these jobs or not. Because government advertised these jobs through its incentive program, and uh, they they. Uh, they enabled the smelter to locate where it was at, at present. But shortly after that, my son got exposed uh, because uh, he used to come to work very often to spend time with me at work because he was still very little. And most of the time I would get a babysitter who worked maybe half of the day and then brought the child to me so that I would stay with him in the office up to the evening and then go back home. Um, at that point, my son, fell sick and uh, when I took him to hospital, it was very hard even for the doctors to diagnose what was wrong with him. Because at that time in 2000, uh, this is 2010, uh, the hospitals were unable, we didn't have capacity in the whole country to lead poisoning. I turned to the government uh, pathologists and they were also unable to test for lead poisoning. In the end, we had to airlift my son's blood to South Africa where it took seven days and the results came back that he was positive for lead poisoning and uh, the reason i suspected lead poisoning is because uh, a friend of mine who worked within government was the first one to tell me that where you are working um, you could be exposed to lead have you heard of lead poisoning i said no and at that time my son was already admitted he didn't know um, whether his condition would improve or not because the doctors were unable to diagnose what was wrong with him so after we got the result back for, from South Africa, my son had tested positive with that five micrograms per deciliter of lead in blood. And it began a journey of me finding out uh, what would be uh, the best treatment for him, but also how I could protect this community. As you can see, there's a community which has eight, uh, at that time had 800 children that were playing directly under the chimneys that were producing lead. This lead, um, was cleaned up in, in Kenya, but exported uh, as pure lead outside the country. So this lead could easily have landed, up, landed in Germany, in the US, in the developed countries where such toxic work is not um, accepted. Therefore, the burden of cleaning up the lead and exporting it to, to, uh, to um, 
so that the people from the other side of the world enjoy the right to a clean and healthy environment. But the people in Onohuru paid the price for the for the um, for the cleaning up of the lead in their in their community. As you can see, in in 2000 and uh, in 2011, we started um, creating awareness that something was going wrong within the community because we had tried to reach. Uh, remember, I had worked within corporation, the corporate world a lot, but this time I stopped working for the corporation and started working for this community called Uinohuru. And uh, I was working for them with only a passion and no payment from anybody. But I tried to, to um, advocate for their right to a clean and healthy environment through writing letters to government, going to their offices, giving them results. But they were not, they were not uh, forthcoming. They were not willing to give up. That is the first time where I saw economic interest outweighed the rights of the people in terms of their rights to life, their rights to a clean and healthy environment, the, all their rights were put under the, 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 what the government was looking at as economic benefits because the government had advertised this project as um, a project that was going to bring in uh, jobs and bring in um, economic benefits for the country. Uh, so in 2010, we started. I started running the community, uh, trying to force the smelter to move from where it was located. Um, you can see so many people joined us in the demonstrations because all of them had seen the effects of the lead in 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 their community. We did uh, demonstrations, uh, trying to force government to listen to us to move the, this this production of lead to a place where um, it was not very densely populated. You can see in um, 2012, you can see the police have arrested us. So uh, the police came after me, they tear cast the community, um, uh, they arrested me and took me to court and charged me with inciting violence and illegal gathering. Um, uh, so the community, what the community sought to do was to defend their right to live in a toxic free environment. They wanted, uh, because the, the constitution of Kenya allows, uh, recognizes the right to a clean and healthy environment in Article 42. And therefore what the community was saying is that uh, we need uh, this, this um, plant to be moved to a place which is not so densely populated. Unfortunately, government did not listen uh after bundling us and and, and uh, sending us to court and charging us with inciting violence we could not do anything for the community for all, a whole year um actually until 2012 and uh for all this time that we are fighting to get ourselves free from court um the 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 smelter continued producing lead and exporting it out of the country so they continued to make profit but at the same time the community situation deteriorated so much because we had children dying we had children who had very high lead levels um i'll just show you a study that was done uh, together with uh, orco institute from germany um this is in 2015 so this is this is uh, several years after we managed to shut down the smelter and you can see that the lead the lead levels uh, uh, in Kenya were very high were recorded at uh, at 420 micrograms per deciliter of lead that is the level in Kenya but you can see in Africa generally because um, this the study was done in uh, four African countries um, you can see from the previous slide in Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Cameroon. And you can see the highest lead level in the next slide is at, is at um, 614 micrograms per, dec per deciliter of lead. Uh, WHO right now defines lead poisoning at 5 micrograms per deciliter of lead in blood. So you can imagine someone who has 614 micrograms in Africa. And this is mostly from recycling of used lead acid batteries where the the pure lead is extracted from the old batteries and then it is exported to the developed world uh, in countries that do not accept this kind of dirty work this is a, a, a picture of the lead levels you know in Uhuru community you can see the highest lead level is at 420 micrograms 
per deciliter of bleeding blood. This is a living uh, person who is uh, still alive. Her name is, is Irene, Ak uh, uh, Irene Akini. And uh, shortly I will show you her slide. But the next, you can see the next, uh, the second person, 23 year old um, Lynette Nabwire, who died. The third person there died. The fourth person there died. So we, are, we have lost uh, several of the people whose blood levels were very high in the community. So uh, when the lead is being produced, there are different uh, ways in which it gets into the human body. Uh, because lead is a heavy metal, when it's uh, released through the chimneys into the environment, it does not go up, it comes back. Uh, it lands the soil, it lands on the houses, it lands on the toys that the children are playing, it lands on the play playground. And this is how uh, the lead ended up um, into uh, being ingested by the children while they were playing through food, through water, while they were, while they are, they are playing. That is how they ingested the, the lead into their bodies. Um, this is a picture of a lady who is living now, uh, Irina Kini, the one who has 420 micrograms. You can see the state that she is in. Her thyroid is giving in. Um, her, her kidneys have stopped working. Her liver has stopped working. Um, I'll show you the next slide where she has, she has um, uh, hospital documents where she has been uh, tested. So she has been left with a big burden. These pictures I took last year and uh, towards the end of last year. And she has been left with a very big um, health burden where she has to, uh, every day, every single cent that she gets has to go into hospital bills, um, taking care of her health to try and extract the lead from her body. But even if we manage to extract the lead from her body, remember that Irene, uh, her kidneys are gone, her liver is gone. So where does she get, uh, where does she get money for all that? The next slide is of a baby. Um, his name is Sami. Sami was also exposed to lead poisoning uh, and died in 2018. Uh, the next one is Lynette uh, Nabwire Baraza. Lynette had, uh, Lynette had desired, she married, uh, and at the time we did the test, she was 23 years old. And Lynette had uh, desired to have a child. But because of the very high lead levels in Oinohuru, she had had three miscarriages. And finally, she managed to carry her baby to term. And when she carried her baby to term to nine months, that was in 2014, 2015. We had forced the smelter to shut down in 2014. And that's how she managed to carry her baby to term. But a few days after, um, after she gave birth, she died. And when we did her postmortem, it showed that the, the, blood, the blood lead levels in a, were too high that the intestines were unable to pump the, the uh, small intestines uh, normally into her body, and that's how she died from lead, uh, lead levels. That is her coffin. Uh, this is Sammy's funeral as we went to, to bury him. Um, and those are some of the impacts the community had from so very chronic diseases in the top, very chronic diseases that have uh, the community is facing now because of um, profits that one company wanted to make um, I will speak a little bit about corruption uh, in environmental protection in Kenya, in Africa. This is one of the reasons why these industries uh, come to locate here because they realize that our environmental laws are very low and uh, our governments prioritize politics and capitalism over uh, the life and livelihoods of the people. And therefore this has been one weakness within our system that has allowed such kind of industries to locate here. Um, the other the other issue is uh, even though we have laws like Kenya recognizes the right to a clean and healthy environment, even though we have laws uh, in the books, but the implementation of these laws is is uh, mad in corruption. For example. 
example, uh, when we took this case to court in, 20, in 2016, the, the court found that these people had, had been given licenses by government. Government has facilitated them to receive licenses even before they had a premises where to locate their, their interest. So immediately they came, they paid money, and they were immediately issued licenses. The government did not understand um, the there was lack of understanding of the impact of what this uh, industry would have on the lives of the people. And we have seen years later the impact that it has had on the Unohuru, um, in, in the Unohuru uh, community. There is very high corruption when it comes to environmental laws. There is uh, the, the uh, environmental activists that try to rise up to protect communities or to speak up with communities are met with judicial harassment, they are met with arrest, they are met with intimidation, and some of them are even killed for trying to protect or to try to stop these um, industries from killing people. So there is, uh, there is the, the government teams up with these industries and these corporations, and what they do is they, they repress, violently repress any activists that are trying to rise up to raise these issues. Uh, because they are prioritizing the, the profits over the lives of the people. Now, I've shown you a slide. The last slide that I will show you is uh, of a court case, in which of the same case, we took the case to court. And last year, we, we won the case and we were, and we were awarded, um, uh, we were awarded 12, million, 12 million US dollars as compensation for the community and we were awarded seven, seven million US dollars to clean up uh, the, the community. So that is where the case is. I hope that I've managed to bring a picture to the, to the participants today of how um, the car industry can impact uh, Africa if we do not join forces together. Because Phil is working from Kenya alone is not able to impact the industry, uh, the lead industry in, in Germany. And that's why we teamed up with institutions like Oiko Institute in Germany, which was able to, to build our capacity and enable us to carry out research in Kenya. You have seen the research. We would not have been able to come up with those blood tests and soil tests and all that. But we partnered with a, 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 an institution in Germany, and we were able to come up with these results. And these results have helped us in court to access justice. And now we are trying also to bring um, uh, to bring government to 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 work on implementing laws that protect the people. We are trying to bring uh, a change, a paradigm shift in the way uh, government implements environmental law and how. Uh, government uh, treats issues of access to justice for, for our communities. I think I'll end up there. I've taken about 30 minutes uh, talking. I need to give uh, space back to, to the participants to be able to ask questions as well. Yes, thank you so much, Phyllis, for this um, talk. Uh, I, I'm feeling very impressed right now and just yeah, amazed how much you did and um, also talking about the repression and the, the threats you got like I'm yeah, I think I would love to talk uh, more about this maybe I, I do have um, one uh, a couple of more questions as well to you maybe um, but yeah at this point um, again to the audience like feel free to ask questions in the chat or um, and then we can read them out or also you can um, like also you can raise your hand and then you can also join with audio if you want to ask a question in person that would also be possible so yeah maybe one question i have um because in the beginning of your talk you talked about how you when you first found out about this you were like also um yeah um trying to convince other people in your community or telling them about this industry and what impact health impact it has on you and other people um so i was just wondering because i when i I read something and about uh, your work and it said that you had a much harder time convincing especially the men in your community because they were working in the factory so i was just wondering about um how did you actually convince the people to stand up with you and is there like some kind of trick that you did or like what do you think is the the key maybe to this kind of successful um, campaigning that you did Oh, 
Okay, um, I think for me, I was very, uh, I was very, um, I'll say I was in time, I was on time because the issues that I was raising were really issues that were affecting the community. But the people who joined me uh, initially were the women because the women were the ones that stayed home with their children. They saw the skin of their children when they came out to play from the playground. They could see the skin rashes on their children. They started seeing fevers. They started seeing that the livestock and the chicken that were eating from the effluent that was leaving the, co the corporation uh, into the community, that they, the livestock died and the chicken died. And so it was easy for me to convince the women uh, because they were living through these issues. And what I, I was explaining to them uh, really struck a chord with them. And then when I took, I told them to, 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 to trust me and to give me three children to go and test. And I took those three children with their parents we went to the lab, the lab drew their blood, and they tested, all three of them tested positive for lead poisoning. So it was very easy for me to, to convince the women at first. But the men, because they were getting employment, most of them were getting employment inside the factory. It was very hard for them to join our movement, actually. They kept uh, trying to convince their wives that uh, uh, Phyllis was just she didn't want to work, maybe she lost her job and that's why she's angry. So it was very hard. But in 2011, there was a man who was working in the industry who fell and uh, passed out. His name was Garissa. And that caused the men to start thinking that maybe thing could be having uh, effects on them. But I remember by 2012, the main thing that the men were complaining about was erectile dysfunction. They were unable to fulfill their marital duties to their women. And this caused a paradigm shift in the men. That is the first time that they called me as men for a meeting in the community. And they told me, Phyllis, there's something we want to tell you. So they called me and told me, Phyllis, do you think this could be related to, to what you are speaking about? And when I confirmed to them, and actually I didn't go alone. I took a, a male doctor that was with me at that uh, and that male doctor is the one who explained to them the effects of what this industry was having on their uh, on their bodies, and that is how we got the men to join us very late in the very late in the movement. But uh, I think that is how I managed to successfully rally the community behind us, and that is one strength that we have had ever since. That um, even though people have tried uh, to go to the community to try and break the movement, to try and you know, to try and uh, disrupt what we are doing. But because these people have lived through the issues that we are talking about, it is not easy to convince them to um, to go against the, the movement that uh, started in Oino Uro. Thank you. That's really fascinating, like really impressive. So like at this point, we do have some questions in the chat already. I have one more question and then I would like to open the room for people in the audience. Um, so one thing that really struck me when you um, were talking was also thinking about the protests that we were part of in the last year um, against the highway A49. And we were like building tree houses in the forest and we were, you know, the police came and they also arrested us and we also faced repression, but not at all in the same extent that you were just talking about like this to actually be in danger of being beaten up or having death threats and I also read that you had to go through some really high security after all your activism and and like so I was just wondering about how how do you like deal with this like do you have some certain mentality or like how like because for me it's like really yeah so far from my own reality like doing activism I don't need to expect this extent of danger to me if I do it so I was just wondering like how how do you deal with this do you have some mentality that you that you have and um, when you think about these topics uh, you know uh, we are all human and there's no human who is immune to to fear so uh, one time I got home in the evening and there were gunmen at my and they beat me up really badly, and they threatened to shoot me and my son. Uh, and uh, I, I escaped because one of my, my neighbors was coming home with his car, and the car's headlights sh shined where we were, where I was lying down because they had hit me and I was lying down. And my son was screaming, and they, I was very afraid because they were going to shoot him. 
And I remember after that, uh, when we escaped uh, and moved out of that place, we, ne we moved out that night. I went to a friend's place and we never went back to that house. Um, and for almost a year after that, I was afraid to sleep even on the bed. I would sleep under the bed. Uh, and I would always try to hide my son so much even at night so that if I would assume maybe someone will come with a gun and shoot through the window. So I would be very afraid most of the time. But um, every time they had, they had, I have found strength as I continue. Because at that time, my son uh, saw on the TV uh, when I was being arrested and thrown on the police truck and the police were throwing tear gas and beating me up. And he, he asked me, Phyllis, uh, mom, are you a bad person? I said, no, I'm not a bad person. Then he asked, are the police bad people? I said, no, Papa, the police are not bad people. So why he didn't understand why if the police were not bad and the mom was not bad, why the police were treating his mom like that? And so for me, that made me want to prove so much to my son that what I was doing was not a wrong thing. He's now, he just turned 15 this month, 15, uh, 15 years this month. And now he understands the reason why I was standing up. He's very passionate about the work that I do. And so uh, that gave me a lot of strength throughout the years. Uh, he finally had uh, me speaking at a public meeting. Uh, I think it was uh, about last two years ago when I came to Germany. And he had me tell the story of how he was he was exposed to lead poisoning and what has led to this. And uh, for me, the journey and what we have achieved is not only in terms of the work that we have done, but the, the fact that my son also realizes that I needed to protect him and I needed to protect the people in Onohuru and that uh, the communities had their rights and those rights needed to be protected. That has made me get strength every day to wake up and continue my work. So I thank my son so much because from the beginning it is uh, my love for him, my passion to protect him that has really driven me even to overcome fear. But that does not mean that I've never been afraid. So many times I've been afraid. So many times I've had to go into hiding. Uh, even when we won the court case uh, and the, there was heightened threats, people went into the Unohu community. We, they burnt 15 houses were burnt because we won the, the court case, you know. Uh, they are trying to intimidate the community. They are trying to make them uh, flee so that the community will break up. Because if the community breaks up, then we don't have a community co to compensate and they can win at their appeal case. But um, many things throughout, there has been different triggers that have helped me to get through. Sometimes it has been friends uh, that just told me, keep going. There are friends who are keep, keep me in hiding when or protect my children when my children need to be protected, and they keep encouraging me to do what 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 I'm doing. So there is many things that have encouraged me throughout the, the the years, but that does not mean that there has not been fear. There has been fear, but somehow I find strength every day. Yeah, that sounds really understandable, and I really like this um, impulse of like sort of family and friends and really having this connection and going together through these um, emotions like fear and other emotions. So yeah, that's really good. Okay, so um, we do have some questions from the chat. I'll just uh, maybe read them out and then um, then you can yeah uh, see what you want to say to this. So the first question is, what kind of support do you, you want from us? All right, I think I'm very grateful, especially to the German public, because we have had so many, so much support from Germany. I have, uh, I have uh, been given an award, the Ethical Blue Planet Award for Germany, uh, and these are things that have helped to raise my profile. Uh, you might not realize it, but when uh, 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 an award is, is given to me from Germany, from the US, it raises my profile. And these people cannot attack me in the same way that they used to attack me when I didn't know anyone, when I was, I was not recognized. So that recognition helps a lot. But all, not only for me, but um, it is quite important now for us to form networks 
with environmental rights defenders even in Africa and in, in, in the developed world. So because the, the issues that we are fighting for are not alienated, they are not separate, they are actually very inter interconnected. The issues that we are fighting for are very interconnected. So for me right now, my passion right now and my desire right now is to form a very strong global network of, en of, of environmental rights defenders that when we talk, we talk with one voice and that our, our message can be very strong uh, as opposed to as it is now because right now we are all scattered uh, we get news of our friends in Mexico, in Honduras, in other places that uh, you know are being executed, they are being killed. They are, we all belong to that family of, of environmental rights defenders, but um, they don't get that uh, publicity or that support that enables them to keep safe. Because right now, um, being on platforms like this one, being recognized in Germany, being recognized in the US, that has raised my, raised my profile a lot. It has also opened doors for me in Kenya because now I'm recognized I can go to the big offices and tell them, no, we have to do this, and they will listen to me, as opposed to when I started. So I wish that more activists could uh, access the same platforms that I have accessed. And that can be done when we create networks among ourselves, very strong networks in Germany and everywhere, so that when Phyllis is affected in Kenya, or when another activist is affected in Kenya, there are voices coming from even Germany, from around the world, speaking for these uh, activists in Africa. That will also enable us, you know, to access justice for the environment and to protect the environment much better. So that is, I think, the support that we need from, from uh, the global community right now. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I feel like the person also who asked this question also was coming from maybe this background. It was actually a person from the um, Ethicon Foundation who asked the question, where you said you got, got the award, Sibylle. Um, thank, thank you for the answer and also for the question. And Sibylle had another um, question, which was, um, have the factory site and the village been decontaminated in the meantime? Um, so the, the court awarded uh, my organization, Center for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action, 7 million US dollars to uh, oversee the cleanup and, uh, and uh, remediation of the area. But uh, the National Environmental Management Authority, very ironically, went back to court to appeal against this. So we are back in court right now, uh, fighting to uphold the judgment of the Land and Environment Court. So, so far we have not managed to get the funds to clean up, but we are uh, fighting in court. And as soon as we finish the appeal, we will uh, process uh, execution documents so that government and the corporations can give us money so that we go back to the community and clean up. It's very long overdue. Um, in, 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 a, in, in a more just society, this should have been done without us going to court. But uh, because uh, of the situation we are in, uh, in a developing world, it forced us to go to court. And very ironically, the people who should be supporting what we are doing, the National Environmental Management Authority, are the ones actually fighting against us and fighting against the cleanup in the community. So that's where we are. The community has not yet been cleaned up. But as soon as the court case um, is done with that, the Court of Appeal, I believe we'll be able to do the cleanup for the community. That's really good to know. Um, so Zabila has one last question, which is, um, what do you think of e-mobility, electric mobility? Jay, what is e-mobility? So um, basically the idea or what is a really big thing in Germany right now because the car industry is being very much attacked for having a lot of CO2 emissions, etc. And now they basically started a new campaign which is, oh well, if you don't like CO2 emissions, we will now have electric cars. So instead of um, yeah, going on like fossil fuel call cars, um, um, they want to build a lot of electric cars, which is basically still a car, but like um, from a different uh, source. You see, um, well, I, I will speak from our perspective in Africa, because we have the, 
we have had a similar problem when it comes to to the um, energy energy sector and they said that because uh, coal is, is dirty and because uh, hydro, is, they don't support hydro, so they brought in what is called um, uh, solar power. And unfortunately, we failed, they failed to look at the aspect that solar power is stored in lead acid batteries. And therefore, and a big, bigger lead acid batteries. And therefore, even though the solar power is uh, green energy now, but you find that the, the the lead acid batteries uh, problem is now worse because we have bigger batteries to deal with. Uh, we have bigger uh, uh, waste, bigger uh, uh, which which means there'll be more people trying to recycle these things, uh, more people trying to export them to, so that they can be sent back in as uh, as uh, part of the green energy. So they, even though we tried we try to solve one problem but it created another problem so there is there is need for researchers to come on board there's need for activists to come on board and actually scrutinize um every technology that is brought to us to ensure that this technology is monitored in a way that it does not uh create the same problem that we are trying to get out of you know Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. And also, I think there are so many problems with um, like electric cars, like different problems to fossil fuel, but more like how also where lithium, I think that's the name of the material that these batteries are made of. Um, it's, yeah, it's very, has some really bad environmental and social implications for a lot of country, like countries in Latin America as well, where this material is coming from. So also, yeah, not, not as simple as that. Uh, so there's a new question. Um, so the question is, would you consider yourself anti-capitalist? Or maybe I read out the second one as well. How do you feel towards white German people who do almost no action to stop the German companies in Germany, even if we have opportunities? Um, so when, when, when I began my work, um, <laughs> when I was still a young girl and uh, I was very, I was described as black and white. I had no gray areas, you know? I, I knew what I wanted and I was very firm. Unfortunately, because I've been doing this work for a very long time, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but because I've been doing this work for, for a very long time, I have learned to accept other views that might not be my, uh, my original views. And therefore, I cannot say that I'm anti-capitalism because uh, we need in Africa we need we need industries we need we need our people to grow we need food we need a lot of things you know but I I want Africa to grow in a way that it it caters for its people and we don't sacrifice our people for the benefit of a few as has been shown in uh, in the case of Oinohuru where a few uh, people, a few people have made very huge uh, profits at the expense of the lives of people like Irina Kini, who are paying for it until today, you know, and uh, as a system that is so broken that so many years later, we have not yet managed to access justice for them. So we need to grow at a pace that uh, is our own and at a pace that uh, we keep checking power, we keep checking the corporations to ensure that what they are doing uh, does not uh, then compromise the lives of other weaker people in the society. And um, in terms of uh, what I feel towards white German people, <laughs> um, I don't think we can categorize because there are people in Kenya also who are very oblivious to the work that we do, you know? I remember we, I met some people in, in government, actually in Ministry of Environment, uh, and we were discussing uh, a resolution, a UNEP resolution on used lead acid battery recycling. And they were asking me, Phyllis, uh, we don't think we have this problem in Kenya. Why are you forcing a resolution through UNEP, you know? And they were very oblivious and I was so startled. Uh, I was very shocked because at that time we had 17 smelters in Kenya, throughout Kenya. 
and they were very oblivious to what was going on. They told me, oh, the only problem we have in Kenya is poaching when it comes to the environment, the animals, you know. So they didn't know. They, they had no capacity to understand. So I took it upon myself. I had to call the people from the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Foreign Affairs. I had to call the people from the Ministry of Environment and teach them even what to talk about at the, at the table where the negotiations were going on. So it's uh, unfortunately, it remains on us activists to take a lot of the burden that is not supposed to be ours. Uh, a lot of the work that is supposed to be done by, by, by government and you know uh, the industry themselves, they leave it there. And, and unfortunately, activists have to pick up this kind of work. So it's not only uh, in Germany, but it's, it's all over the world. There's a, a, a group of people that just oblivious to what is going on. They don't care about climate change. They don't care about the environment. They, as long as they wake up and eat, and more so here in Africa, because they have, we, our people have so many problems. Uh, they have so many economic problems. They have so many social problems. And they, they, they don't necessarily take time to understand. But it, 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 the onus remains on us to keep doing the work that we are doing. And uh, Wangare Matai said, you have to be, you have to be a hummingbird. When the forest is on fire, carry some water in your beak and just drop it in the, in the, in the forest. It might not turn, out, uh, turn off the fire, but your efforts will, will achieve something in the long run. So we have to keep doing our part uh, and trying to get as many people as we can to join us, to join the movement. I'm very glad when I look back at where we started and where we are now. A lot of people have gained recognition of the work that we are doing, even here in the country. If you mention Phyllis Omidu, you mention Uinohuru, almost everyone in the country will know who Phyllis is and what the Uinohuru community is. When I walk into government offices, it's very different. So we have to keep doing the small things that we are doing. And in the long run, we might not see the fruits, but our children and our children's children should inherit a better world than uh, what we have, we have created for them today. Absolutely. I really like the metaphor with the forests and the honey, like I, I'll remember that. Um, so I have one more question, maybe. Um, also, I think we have time for one more. Um, we have 10 more minutes. So if you have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, there is actually one. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question from Zabilla again um, first. So the question is, um, you founded an NGO. Um, what is your main work today? All right, we have a lot of work that we are doing, uh, but mainly we partner with communities. Uh, we have, uh, I've told you about the litigation case where we take cases to court on behalf of uh, communities that are fighting for environmental justice. We have created a Kenyan National Network for Environmental Rights Defenders, and uh, we have managed to bring on board partners like the UNEP and OECR to support grassroots environmental rights defenders. We work with the uh, environmental rights defenders, documenting the situation of environmental rights defenders. Now, if you go on the internet, uh, the World Resource, uh, uh, World Resource Network, uh, we have we have uploaded data on the situation of environmental rights defenders in Kenya, uh, what their needs are. You know, we have we document what their needs are and how people can support uh, uh, environmental rights defenders. We also have uh, have programs that we run on a day to day basis. Our organization is small. I have eight staff. Uh, we have eight staff. But we are working now because when we started working just in one community, then we expanded to five counties in Kenya. And now we are in the 47 counties of Kenya. We have representatives on the, in the 47 counties of Kenya. So we do uh, work mainly. Uh, our, our, our mission is um, to ensure that we raise a generation that understands, respects uh, the, the right to a clean and healthy environment because it has been very hard has been a very tough than even getting people within government, within uh, the, the, the human rights movement to accept the right to a clean and healthy environment as a right, even though it's assured in the constitution. So we do a lot of work. Uh, maybe um, uh, Jay will share the link or I can share the link uh, afterwards. 
uh, to our website and then you can look a bit more to see the work that we are doing. But we are doing so much work uh, around uh, the right to a clean and healthy environment in Kenya. Absolutely. I'm happy to share the link in the chat just now. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, one more, maybe even the final question. Um, so the question is, what do you think is the best way to get out of the situation? What kind of steps need to be taken? What kind of solutions do you see besides the cleaning? And is there any healthy way to produce and recycle batteries? The, right now, we are we are asking, uh, especially from the developed world, the learning institution, to do more research in uh, recycling of lead acid batteries because so far there is no technology that we have seen globally that is able to do this in a clean way that does not uh, affect the environment. The other thing is then there should be very stringent monitoring when doing the production of lead acid batteries because we also do not want a situation where people are keeping batteries inside their houses because that also will end up uh, uh, getting the children and their houses contaminated with, with lead. So um, we still have to have a place where these batteries are taken, but they, has, they have to be done in an environment that is very strictly uh, controlled so that they keep all that uh, the contamination within that same environment. And there has to be measures that protect the workers and uh, the testing of the workers, their blood and all that has to be done very, very closely. We are monitoring the, the existing industries in Kenya that are doing this work to ensure that they are doing this for the, the workers and that they are not uh, polluting the environment so much uh, like we saw. We ended up closing, um, I think, 17 factories in Kenya. Uh, that were doing this work because we were not satisfied with the, the way the work was being done. The technology that was being used in, uh, in Kenya is very old, very archaic technology where they were still breaking these batteries with their hands and hammers and uh, it was very dangerous for, for the people. So far, there is no, I've not seen uh, a technology that has been safe. We have worked with communities in Australia, we, have, we are in touch with communities in the U.S. that have all been affected uh, because of lead acid battery recycling. So, so far, I don't think there's a safe way to, to do this work. Um, and the solutions besides cleaning, there is no solution besides cleaning. We have to remediate. We have to remove the soil uh, in the community. We have to remove the, the lead from the walls, from the iron sheets, because remember, when it rains now, the, the community will tap the, the water from the iron sheets and they'll drink this water. So they are drinking in lead. And so the, 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 the community is, is a very highly toxic place. So there is no other way except for us to remove those iron sheets, put new iron sheets, uh, scrape the walls and put new um, cement on the walls and then remove all the soil, put fresh soil and then plant uh, uh, vegetation and trees that will help absorb uh, or any any other remaining elements and that will help to clean uh, the soil that we put in to ensure that um, the environment is restored to what it was before. But um, I think that is the only solution we have with us uh, at, this, at this time. Uh, what kind of steps can we take um, to get out of this situation? I think we have taken the steps that were were open for us because the first step we took in 20, um, 2015 was to do a petition to parliament. We did a petition to Senate. We tried to create a task force through parliament that would address this issue. We were able to do that. Then we went to court. So I think we have done everything that is possible here locally to address this issue. Globally, though, there is a lot more that can be done. Uh, we are partnering with so many people internationally, uh, especially now in terms of uh, helping the communities to document their situation. Uh, there are many communities that are fighting the same issues that do not have access to uh, testing. You know, there's gaps in terms of collecting evidence of what they are saying, just much as we did. 
so there is a lot that we are doing with the international NGOs and international um, partners uh, in terms of assisting the communities also documenting, collecting evidence and uh, you know creating a, a case for themselves in, a, in environmental justice. I think uh, I've tried to answer almost all the questions. Absolutely, and um, thank you. I, I do have one more question actually, which just came up and it's uh, important uh, to me. So I remember reading that your um, book with the rage of a mother um, was published in German only. And I was wondering if you could say some more words to what you think is the connection between the German car industry and lead recycling in Kenya. Um, Germany has the, I think the biggest uh, car industry globally. And uh, we have many cars that are brought in in Kenya also from, from Germany, a lot of, uh, you know, BMWs and these, you know, big cars that people want to drive the German machines <laughs> in Kenya. So for me, um, I believe that if we, long, if, we did, if we did the first book in Germany, uh, it would have an impact not only on the car industry, but also in Kenya, where, you know, there is a group, uh, we have said there's a group of people who are way high up, they don't realize that the German machines and all this affect them. But if they hear about this, they read about this from Germany coming to Kenya and its effect, we are able to reach uh, a very big, a very wide audience, not only in Germany, but also in Kenya. But also I wanted to have some kind of impact on the, on the car industry in Germany and create an awareness in the German public because the only way the car industry will will uh, try to streamline its practices is when the public is aware, is when the German public starts talking about these issues, when activists are rising up and saying, no, you have to uh, look out on this issue. And when Germany takes the lead in these issues, then the whole globe, the whole the whole world uh, will take will take uh, will take uh, action on this issue because Germany is a leader when it comes to uh, the car industry globally. Thank you, um, Phyllis. Uh, yeah, that's that's really inspiring. And I have not read your book yet, but I will definitely read it now. <laughs> um, so this book was published um, last September, uh, since September 2019. And yes, it's called Mit der Wut einer Mutter in German. So yeah, um, with these words, like I, I think you really said some important things, like so interesting to learn about your work, but also this like, what you said about the importance of creating global networks. Also, I like a lot of thoughts are now in my head about the responsibility of the climate movement in the global north. Like, what is our role here? How can we support you? Like, how can we, yeah, not sort of or focus too much on our own struggles, but also like always see it in a bigger context and yeah, be be clear about our responsibility that we have here as well. Like, I think, yeah, you said some really inspiring things about that. So I would love to stay in touch and create this global network or be part of that. So yeah, thank you so much for being here today and for um, telling us about your work and for answering the questions. Uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of uh, or thank you messages in the chat as well from the audience. So uh, yes, um, this uh, talk will be uh, published on our website afterwards. So you can also share the link then with other people who are not able to attend live. And um, yes, so in, in these words, thanks very much again. and. Have a great evening. Or do you have anything else to add? <laughs> yeah, just a shout out to my friend Carola. I can see she's, she's there. Thank you for the support. Uh, thank you for the solidarity with us. Thank you for everyone from Ethicon Blue Planet. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate all the support from Germany. And you might not realize what a difference it does, but it makes a difference makes a very huge difference so keep doing it uh let's keep partnering let's keep supporting each other every day and i'm available whenever i'm required to speak or to do anything because uh it's a step towards the right direction thank you so much everyone thank you phyllis bye bye bye, bye everyone